So what can we do to help promote resilience and recovery? We all know that the answer to this question is not easy. There is no quick fix. But there are several important principles that both neuroscientists and clinicians agree on. These principles can guide professionals and carers working with children who've experienced abuse and neglect. Here we hear from a range of leading clinicians and researchers who each reflect on one of these key principles. The brain is, is essentially an organ that's all about learning and adapting to the environment. So environmental inputs, you know, the things that are happening around the child, are absolutely key in the way that the brain develops over time. When you look at the way the brain develops, it's the most extraordinary kind of orchestra of biological events. Within the womb, it's already kind of creating itself in a very complex set of interactions between molecules and the environment that the, the fetus is finding itself within. So the brain is like this plastic organ that is constantly responding to the environmental inputs that it, it experiences uh, and adapting and building and, and, and moulding itself to the social environment. When we trust someone, we open our minds to them, open our ability to learn. So when I think about teachers who had influenced me, they were teachers who actually took an interest in me as a person. And that somehow creates a key, opens a door on a, a part of my mind where I'm willing to learn new things from that person. We find always the most complicated word to describe the simplest thing. We call this epistemic trust, a trust in knowledge. If I feel understood by you, I'll open my mind to you so that you will be able to teach me and I will learn from you about things that mathematics, English, whatever that subject is. So what actually turns out from uh, actually decades of research and education that children learn best from teachers uh, who have an accurate and individual understanding of them as a person, as a child. The foster carers are interested and curious anyway. The fact that they want to be foster carers would suggest that there's a level of interest in wanting to kind of help somebody. Um, and also offer a different experience to somebody. So the interest is, is, is already there. But I think sometimes when the lived experience for them is that when they actually get a, ch a young person with all of these difficulties, it can sometimes close down their um, curiosity because they've been faced with such challenging behaviour and uh, the instinct is to react to that, that challenging behaviour. So I think so, some of the, the practical ways would be for foster carers to have kind of regular I don't know, support groups where they can meet with, 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 with other foster carers, um, to have a, a regular time of where they can kind of be more re reflective in terms of what's happening. So to actually look at particular s scenarios that happen in their everyday life um, and to help them to kind of put on, if you like, a reflective cap. So they're thinking about um, not necessarily just the interaction, but the interaction, but what the interaction mean, because it might mean something completely different to what it looks like on face value. I'm a great fan of the importance of pausing, taking a moment when we try and work out what's going on. Um, and it can make all the difference in transforming reactions which are often quite impulsive, maybe quite poorly thought out, and transforming and changing them into responses that have an idea of our own, of other people's intentions behind them. So the swimming coach demonstrated that just so well taking a moment to try and make sense of something that didn't quite add up, um, opened up the possibility of a, a whole new sequence um, that affected at least three different relationships. And crucially, someone else pausing helped the boy in the film to make his way back. He didn't have to do it all on his own. And having a team around us who will help to create those kinds of opportunities and map the way back from near misses can I think be just quite transformational 
in reshaping a child's opportunities in life. This young boy who's showing this really aggressive behavior or externality can be read at surface level. And you can take this as, what an unpleasant child I've got to look after now as a sports teacher with the others and, the, and I have to look out for trouble. And he's so sullen and resentful, really hard to like him. And then it's perhaps somewhat of a punitive response arouse, is aroused in the sports teacher or any adult having to cope with a difficult social situation. But if you think what that musculature in the face is hiding, yeah, those feelings we saw when the boy looked into the mirror, I'm rubbish, I'm nothing, I'm worthless, and that's what gets built into his body, then it's much easier to empathize with him and to take that step back. One of the things the foster carers have said is that they really value um, having um, training and insight into behaviour because they really um, find it very interesting about thinking about the different meanings of behaviour. And that's one of the things that, that has really enabled them to kind of step back rather than react. Um, so they're able to kind of step back and think very differently about a child's behaviour. When you can really think about someone's behaviour and the potential meaning behind that behaviour, it really does free you up to then do something differently yourself. For example, in the animation, um, the child who has um, the difficulty in the swimming pool um, and kind of reacts to the other boy um, and then is told to get out of the swimming pool, the teacher finds a way to be able to adjust their response to that child and kind of finds a way to make some repair in the relationship between them and the child. But there isn't then an opportunity to kind of wonder, I wonder what happened when that boy splashed you? Why did you react the way you did? What do you think the, the other boy was trying to do? Um, what might you do if that happens again? Is that something that's particularly difficult for you? Um, and kind of, is there a way that we can, everybody can kind of adjust themselves around that kind of situation and, and be helpful for him, for that child in that situation? And I guess the foster carer has the opportunity, if the teacher passes on that information, to be able to have that conversation, to be able to do some of that working through. Um, and I think that's quite a fundamental role. Otherwise, the child or young person experiences their social world is quite fragmented. And the making sense process really might um, help them to um, adjust the way that they react to things and kind of t be able to take some responsibility for that and really not just necessarily make changes for themselves, but be able to communicate something of their experience so that other people can help them um, and give them different experiences in response to them. How do I keep myself going? Is I've got to think about who, who are my friends? Who are my colleagues? Who thinks about me in the way that helps me remember that what I'm doing is hard? That it's hard to, to help young people who don't necessarily make it easy to help them. And it's tiring and it can feel very thankless. And unless there are people around me that recognise the challenge that I'm going on, it's likely that I'll get tired or I'll get lonely. Because sometimes it can work that a worker does make a wonderful connection with a young person. I mean, genuinely. And that's great, but what can happen is they can start to believe and feel, I'm the only one in the world that really understands this kid. And that might be sort of partly true, but that's a really lonely place to be and you can feel overwhelmed by the responsibility. So if you start to feel you're the only person that understands this young person, it's a cue, it's a reminder to check who's holding your rope, check who's connected to you, because you need to be part of a connection of minds uh, to be helpful to, to, to a very vulnerable young mind in front of you. I think it's just really important to think about well-being and, and mental health as a team effort. 
Um, the basic idea that I think is so clearly captured in the film is that our well-being is, is socially created, that we learn about ourselves, we learn about other people through our experiences with the people around us. So, you know, in effect, how we are thought about, how we are felt about, how others behave to, towards us, um, in some ways shapes how we then go on to think about, feel about other people. Um, and so just as our sense of ourselves can be socially created, one of the vulnerabilities is that it can also be socially destroyed or at least damaged. Um, not just, I think, in, in the early years of development, but throughout our development, the, the idea of social th thinning that was introduced, I think, is important, where opportunities for new learning through other relationships diminish as life goes on, as some of these more maladaptive patterns have that kind of in, insidious effect um, in, in the network of people around us. Um, so the, the, the crucial thing, I think, is that while we might see the problem arising in a social context, I really believe that the solution can be found in that social context as well. Um, so that the damage that may be socially created can also be socially repaired.